and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us with the coming to us with the now launched version of Fey Earth on Kickstarter. The one and only, don't call him John, Neil Byrne. How you doing today, man? How's it going? Good to be back. <laughs> I had to get I had to get one gag in, out of my system before before I start before I started. And that has to be done. Mm-hmm. So it's it's been about a it's been about a year since I had since I had you in the te- in the temple to talk about it when you were um, put when you were putting that um introductory package on itch.io um mm-hmm. how how have things been since then they've been they've been good like well mix I suppose would be a fair way to put it um like I've continued to grow on Twitter um well over 2,300 followers now on Twitter, which is, you know, not insubstantial, you know. Um, we started a Kickstarter, and we actually had our one-year anniversary of the Kickstarter on, I think it was actually on, I think it was either yesterday or the day before. It was It was, It was. was this week, um, and I'd completely missed the fact that it had been a year because I launched my Kickstarter um, on Tuesday. Um, so that was a, a that was a pleasant surprise, um, and that actual podcast of our campaign that was a campaign which we just finished um, a week ago. Um, we have um, episode eighty eight went up this week. Episode eighty nine will be going up next week, and then the final episode, the big finale climactic bbeg battle episode 90 will be going up in hopefully about two weeks time um which is very exciting but a lot of feels a lot of emotions you know this is a story we've been telling for five years so not going to give any spoilers but just to say saying goodbye to those characters but that story is now finished you know um like we play those characters from first to 20th level which in this hobby is incredibly rare um, to to have a campaign run for that long is incredibly rare, and to actually get all the way from first tier, all the way up through the epic tiers to twentieth level, mm-hmm. um, is it, 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 it was a lot. Um, so um, very excited to be starting campaign two on my podcast series in November. Very very excited about that. It's going to be set um, thirty years uh, into the future. Um, our first uh, series was set in the year. 1849 in Ireland. Mm-hmm. Campaign two is set in the in the year 1872 in France, mm-hmm. and which is actually the year and date of um, the game itself um, uh, in the core rulebook. If you were to buy the hardback of Fay Earth, it's set in the year 1872, um, mm-hmm. specifically because in in the world of Fay Earth, um, that is just when the Franco-Prussian War ended. However. In our world, because it's a alternate 19th, 19th century Earth in which the Fey have influenced history um, in Europe in, in Fey Earth, there is a powerful Fey nation, Arcadia, that is kind of in between what would be modern day Germany and France mm-hmm. and half of, m- m- half of Switzerland and the Austrian Alps. And it's a very, very powerful nation in the world of Fey Earth. And in the setting, the king of, of Arcadia. Um, an elven king who had been a ruler of that kingdom for like 800 years um, had died of old age and his son took over and um, I mean you have to remember like in 19th century Europe the monarchy was still very much a thing governments were still very much ruled through their monarchies Mm -hmm. Um, noblemen had positions in governments it wasn't until really the end of the 18th or the 19th century, like the 18, late 1880s, 1890s, was when you started seeing steps towards something closer to what would be a, 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 a true democracy. They weren't true democracies because, you know, women still didn't have the vote um, and, and the likes. And, and even the earliest votes, it was only landlords that had the vote, but still, like, so 1870s, monarchies were still very much a thing. 
So mm-hmm. the idea of the idea of a single monarch ruling what is one of the most powerful nations in Europe for eight centuries and then dying, massive political ramifications. Mm-hmm. And in the world of Fayer, the political ramification was that brilliant German politician Otto von Bismarck decides to have a chat with Napoleon III of France, who did not like Otto von Bismarck and really hated the Prussians, but convinced him, hey, you know what? That really powerful neighbor of ours is weak. They have a new king. Let's attack them. So the Franco-Prussian War in Feyerth was not a war between Prussia and France, but an alliance between Prussia and France against Arcadia. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you st- and and the campaigns, the campaign, the world of Feyerth is set just after the end of the Franco-Prussian War, um, and it's a really exciting and fun story because. In this war, the, for the first time ever, a Fey army started to take casualties against the human army, thanks to um, in improvements in rifling technology and artillery. Because mm-hmm. prior to this, every time a human army went against the Fey, they were wiped out. You know, you're facing an army that has, your, their cavalry are actual centaurs, you know. Their mm-hmm. heavy infantry are giants and trolls. Their riflemen are seasoned dwarves, you know, and that's before you get into all the other magical creatures in their army, mm-hmm. you know, so any time historically humans had fought a fey army in, you know, battlefield combat, they were wiped out, but then in this arm, in this battle, they, the humans, they weren't decimating the fey, but the fey were now taking casualties for the first time ever, so they got very, they're getting worried about this, and in what some would call a moment of desperation, the new king, the new elven lord, the new uh, the ruler of Arcadia, the Sve Nation, travels high up to the Alps, to the peaks of the mountains, and awakens the ancient dragons that have been asleep for centuries, mm-hmm. and calls on them to aid him. And they do, and defeat the, the Franco-Prussian alliance, and win the war for Arcadia. But they are now traveling across Europe looking for their young, because... As reptiles, they had laid their eggs and left them to hatch centuries ago, but they can't find any of their young. But they're hearing stories of medieval knights slaying dragons while they were asleep. So that is the setting that campaign two of our of our of our of our game will be in. But that is also the the setting that Fair itself. Um, started um, in the core rule book in the game itself. So it's a really exciting time. There's been a major war. Um, there's a huge conflict that has just happened. And then you've got the fallout of that conflict. Humans whose sons and husbands went off to fight and many of them didn't come back or if they did were badly injured or they were maimed or crippled, you know, because of the horrors of war. Um, you have some humans who are now really hating the Fae and Fae touch the humans with Fae blood in them. Others who, because you've got at the same time anarchism beginning to grow in Europe, socialism growing in Europe, having even more of a reason to hate the the nobility and the ruling classes. Oh, and did I mention there's dragons now? Mm-hmm. And so. with the with the. With that in mind, since we're de- since we're dealing with an alternate history, since we're dealing with alternate history, usually with with a lot of alternate history um, stor- stories, settings, and whatnot, there's usually one di- there's usually one diverging point from wh- from where actual history uh, went and where the alternate tale ended up going. Um, in Fey Earth, what is that di- what is that diverging point? We see, that's the thing. There's no one diverging point because the whole idea behind Feyord is the Fey have always existed alongside humanity. So they've mm-hmm. always been there and influenced society. So mm-hmm. it's lots of little changes that have occurred. So the existence of magic and stuff like that. I suppose one of the big actual divergences would be the history of colonialism and colonization. So mm-hmm. um, the transatlantic slave trade in Feyord only lasted about 100, 150 years. And then it was stopped by the Mali Empire of West Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, also, North America in um, in Fair Earth is very different. The United States exists, but it's much, much smaller. It's basically the East Coast, Florida, and then around to New Orleans. And that's it. The entire rest of, 
of the continental landmass that would be in our world, the United States of America, is completely under the control of the indigenous First Nation peoples. And mm -hmm. part of the reasons for that is magic. Uh, not in a, not in the way you might think, but, um, but because like, I mean, I'm Irish, I'm European. I, I studied some, you know, US history when I was in school, but not a lot, you know, mm -hmm. I was busy learning my own history. So we learned a bit about the, um, you know, your war of independence and a small bit about the civil war. So I, I had to do my own research. And when I was doing my own research on the history of the United States and on the effects of co uh, colonialism in the US, both pre and post independence, the one thing I kept seeing was when I talked about the the devastation of the indigenous peoples was um, his, like estimates that up to 90% of the population was killed by disease. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I saw in my research. You know, I know that's debated. Some have said it was lower, but but up to 90% of the indigenous population was killed by the diseases that European settlers brought. But in a world of fey earth where magic is real, healing magic is real. Mm -hmm. So you can cure diseases. So now you have a situation where the indigenous population in North America is nine times what it historically was when the um, colonial groups were facing them. So that's part of the reason why um, North America is overwhelmingly still ruled and controlled by the indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and like you also, I, I also have like ideas of like, there's like, you know, when they started, there's, there, when, the, um, um, when the US government decided to try and start going into the plains and the whole manifest destiny thing that there was major battles mm -hmm. with the indigenous tribes who because of their close relationship with the Fae and the spirits of the land, they had them as their allies. And um, whereas the the white US government and the descendants of the colonists who are descendants of Puritans, the, the North America in and the United States in, in Fae Earth is magic is it's not that they're completely anti magic, but for a long time they were, you know, because it was Puritans who founded the colonies, you know? So mm -hmm. For the first couple of hundred years of, of that history of the colonies, if you showed signs that you had magic, you risked being burned at the stake, you know? Mm -hmm. So so I, I, I like the idea that the Industrial Revolution was a bit more going on in the US and not pure, and not as much of a, you know, Britain and France thing um, because they were anti-magic, but at the same time, they were still don't have magic. And then when you're facing people who have magic, and they can heal casualties after a battle with magic, so their soldiers recover quicker and to a higher extent. And then they have things like the alliance with the Sasquatch people of the Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're fighting guys, and and they have buddies who are like two meter tall bipeds who can like snap you in two. Yeah. So so those so as they say so there's not one divergence because it's not like a oh well, there was this thing that happened that is different and now everything changes. It's that. There is this difference that's always existed. So you have lots and lots of little changes, like the fact that in Europe, um, one of the most powerful nations was the nation of Arcadia, which the region, and I deliberately picked this, the region that Arcadia um, is made up of was a region that was controlled by the Habsburg dynasty, which was the most powerful royal dynasty in Europe. Like they controlled the Holy Roman Empire. So now you've got this fey group that's different. So government, human nations don't quite, didn't have quite as much power and influence. A religion also different in that religion was never able to gain the same level of political power as it did historically, because it's much harder to convert somebody to a religion if you turn up and say, well, that, that God you're praying is not real, and they turn around and say, but our priest just cured that lad's broken leg. So if our God's not real, where's he getting that magic, you know? So so mm -hmm. it's so as I said, there's lots and lots of lots of little changes. So that overall, in many ways, the world of Fay Earth is quite similar to the way it was in the nineteenth century. But then you got all these fun little differences, like there are people with magic. You have industry in which they're using you've got your coke and coal powered furnaces, but you've also got magic powered furnaces, you know? Um and stuff like that as well. Um on top of it, on top of everything. So yeah, as I say, it's not one thing, lots of little things. Mm -hmm. And with that, in, with that in mind, when you when you mentioned the when you mentioned that um, alliance between between France and, and Prussia, 
I'm curious if in, if in this alternate history, um, France is still allied with the United States. Honestly, I haven't really looked into, thought about that side of it as much because, as I said, the United States in this world, it's smaller, so mm -hmm. it's not quite as economically powerful. Um, France would certainly have been an ally to them. Um, the fact that, you, like, when I was thinking about in what ways the U.S. would, ha would be different, I was like, well, we have to have New Orleans because New Orleans is amazing. You need New Orleans has to exist in my world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's one of the most wonderful and one of the oldest cities in the United States. So you still have stuff like that. So there would have been still the, the Louisiana Purchase and all those kinds of things happening as well. So there would still be a certain level of alliance between the two. And also because, as I was saying, I like the idea that um, they, the, 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 the cities in the U.S. was really help, um, encouraging the growth of inventors and engineers and scientists a lot. So, you know, if you want really good guns, the ones that they're making in the U.S. are really good because of their focus on engineering and science and less reliance on magic, you know. So you've got that kind of thing going on. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, yeah, so you've got that. Um, so there would be certainly some level of of alliance between the two, but I suppose I haven't hadn't really worked out in what ways it would be different. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, I will. I will see. I will see. Bring that up because that um, that al that allyship one was cr was crucial during the Revol during the Revolutionary War of keeping the British fleet off off of the coast. And two, it play, it played a factor in what side um, America joined World War One in, which America joining World War One was was largely a political move. Well, I mean, this thing, um, the game is set fifty years nearly before World War One, but no, mm -hmm. certainly from the, in the historical perspective, France would have still very much been allying itself to the colonies during the War of Independence because it would have been, hey, this is great, we get to screw over the British, you know. Um, so the French, the Dutch, they would have still been allying themselves to the to the colonies and in the U.S. War of Independence, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, how whether how closely allied they were in eighteen seventy two that had to be that'd be I, I, that, those kinds of things I don't like to hard code into the game. That's the kind of stuff I'd like to leave kind of open. So that the GM can decide what way they want those relationships to be in the game, you know, because um, obviously I'm not trying to sound like a cop out. I, one, um, it's great to have lots of information, but you still want to have a certain amount of freedom in how you're going to run your version of the world that you're playing in, you know. Mm -hmm. But with now with that in with that. In my, with that in mind, um, I'm guessing that within the full within the full book, there's going to be a bit of a primer of of some of the major some of the major events leading up to the quote unquote present day, for lack of a better term, and oh, and yeah. how it and how things how things diverge, especially when it comes to certain nations, because when you have well, when you have a whole when you have a whole fey based nation in Europe. That obviously is going to change the landscape of every place surrounding it. Oh yeah, definitely. So, like one of the one of the big things was um, it, one of the big changes in it is that um, um, the Alsace Lorraine region um, is part of Arcadia, but it wasn't always. So mm -hmm. during the during the period in European history when the witch persecutions were happening in France, um, they weren't. Well, actually, the funny thing about France was um, in France. They were persecuting people more because they thought they were werewolves than witches. But, be, be, but regardless, in France during the witch persecutions, um, as well as uh, targeting people because they thought they were witches or werewolves, they were also targeting the fae twitch, which are, in my setting, humans who you have some fae blood in your in your family tree. You know, one of your ancestors is fae, and they and they were starting to attack certain fae. And you know, the Alsace Lorraine region, which is bordering Arcadia, there's a lot of fae twitch there. And uh, eventually, Arcadia and um, France went to war, and Arcadia ended up annexed that region mm -hmm. um, and, and took it. 
out of themselves. Which, you know, when you look at the history of that region, Germany and France were fighting over that region. Well, what, mod, what is modern day Germany? The, 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 the then duchies that became the modern day German um, nation, they mm -hmm. were fighting over that forever. So, so that's that. So that's a difference, you know. And that, you no, know, in, in this world, Alsace Lorraine was annexed by Arcadia. So Strasbourg exists, but it's a city in a fey nation, you know. Um, so you've got that those kinds of differences in it as well. Like the other thing I would say is that, like, the focus of the game is very much on Europe. Um, mm -hmm. At the moment, it's on Western Europe. If the Kickstarter um, uh, is successful enough, though, um, beyond the initial funding, one of our stretch goals. I have a folklorist who, if we hit a certain level in our stretch goals, has agreed to come on to the project um, as a consultant. Um, their background is Slavic folklore, and we would be expanding the setting into Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe as well, into the Slavic region, so we can bring Slavic folklore into the game itself. Because at the moment, it's very much Western European folklore mm -hmm. that the setting is based in. Because that's the folklore me as an Irishman I'm most familiar with. Like my day job, I teach maths and science to teenagers in secondary school. I didn't have the time to try and learn Slavic folklore. Like that's the kind of thing people go to university to study. So, you know, um, but, um, so, so, but if we do hit our stretch goals, we have a Slavic folklorist who's already agreed and would love to work on the project with us, um, which would be really exciting because it would literally double the size of the world. And Slavic folklore is like, it's so rich. Mm -hmm. um, so really hoping that we can hit that stretch goal. Um, if not, um, if we do successfully fund, but we don't hit that stretch goal, then once I've hit fulfillment for the for this initial stretch goal, I will be immediately doing a new Kickstarter for a, for an Eastern European expansion um, mm -hmm. of of the setting uh, before the next Kickstarter, which would be an Africa expansion. Um, which one's already be doing work on. Um, one of the players in my campaign, um, she's been living in Ireland since she was about 12, but she's originally from Zimbabwe. So she's already been doing kind of work for me on Southern African um, kind of folklore and culture. She's, a, she's a, from uh, the Shona people. Um, mm -hmm. So she, we already have one. I already have one, one African consultant and we'll be getting more African consultants from Central, Eastern, Western, you know, other parts of Africa. For that expansion, but you know, um, but 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 it's all a case of trying to build it up and get the funding, you know, to have all these people working with us, mm -hmm. um, which just makes it then a, a richer and more um, a more exciting world to play in. Yeah. Now, within the within the setup, you you can't you've mentioned that there, that there's two that there's two primary lineages, that being the. Um, True Fey and the Fey and the Fey touched. Um, I'd like to go. I'd like to go go into a bit of the line between the two of them. Well, in terms of playable backgrounds or lineages in the game, you can play a normal, boring human human or a Fey touched human, which is mm -hmm. basically, as I say, a human with Fey blood in them. Like the True Fey are not playable in the game because mm -hmm. they're just too powerful. It does. There's no way to have to play a goblin or a fairy or a kobold or a huldra, you know, or any other fae really, and have a properly balanced game, you know. It would be, you'd have to have an all fae game um, where everybody is true fae and you're playing in one of the fae nations really um, in order to have anything close to game balance. Um, but the, the, so the big difference, like the, the fae touch are, they are humans, but they have... A, a couple of extra qualities, depending on, on your fey lineage. And like the way we've designed the game, you could decide, I want to be really specific and say, oh, my great, great, whatever many times granddad was an elf, mm -hmm. you know? And I have slightly pointed ears and I'm really beautiful. And I have one or two other minor magical abilities. Fey Twitch will, uh, will always have some minor magical abilities. And the, in terms of the stats and the mechanics for the game, one of your ability scores is your magic score. And you, in order to be able to spell cast, you must have a minimum magic of one. Now, if you're playing one of the spell casting classes, you want to have a magic score of two or three minimum start. You know? mm -hmm. um, it'd be like someone trying to play a fighter in, say, something like 5e with a strength of 11 or 12. You know, it's just mm -hmm. it's a bad idea, you know, a yeah. no magic of one. But your magic score is also the number of cantrips that you know. So, and, and, and the Fey Touched are all born with 
a magic score of one because of their Fey blood. So every Fey touched ha- knows at least one cantrip, you know? Um, now, if you're, if this is an NPC, um, a housewife or a butcher or a carpenter or whatever, then the cantrips that they know are going to be, you know, everyday things that are going to be really useful, like the mending cantrip, you know, or um, the, 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 the lantern cantrip or, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of stuff, you know? You're not yeah. going to be, you're not there, you know, if, if, if this is an NPC that, you know, is a laborer on the docks, they're not going to be able to, fu- they're not going to bother knowing how to fire out shards of magic to attack people with, you know? Um, so, the, but, but, but at the same time, they do have a tiny level of magic in them. And then um, you, you have, you have your abilities. So um, say, for example, one of the players in our campaign, um, her, mm-hmm. she, she decided she was, she was really, uh, she was a gunslinger and she was a frost giant fake. So mm-hmm. somewhere in her family tree, one of her ancestors was a frost giant. Um, and then yeah. one of the other mechanics in the game is at, st- at, at seventh and 14th level, you will gain more abilities based on your fave lineage, but only if your magic score has increased. So every third, every odd numbered level, you get to increase one of your ability stats. Um, and um, so if you do increase your magic score, then you gain other abilities. So at seventh level, she had brought her magic up to two, so she was resistant to cold damage. And then at 14th level, was completely immune to cold damage because of her frost and lineage. Now, with mm-hmm. a lot of the lineages, you'll have like a couple of different choices. And the way the way the the way the um, the, the the lineage is designed, you can be super specific about the type of fate you are. But the type of fate you pick is is grouped into categories like giant kin, forest fae, uh, mirror fae, you know that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. you'll have a couple of different choices um, of what you can pick. But at the same time. If you decide, well, I want to play a character who is Fae Touch, but they never really were comfortable with their Fae lineage, and they never talked into it, so they didn't increase their magic score, well, mm-hmm. then that's represented in you not gaining those those extra abilities at higher levels. So if, let's say, at 15th or 16th level, or 8th or 9th level, you increased your magic, then you would get the previous ability that you would have gotten at 7th or 14th, respectively. Um, mm-hmm. so, you, so the Fae Touch do have some minor abilities that might be... Um, uh, uh, as well as like specific cantrips and other things like height and strength, maybe mm-hmm. they've got some 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 innate other magic or spell that they might be able to cast, or things like a resistance to a specific type of damage based on their ancestry. Which is mm-hmm. so there are so you've got similarities with the true fey that your character's ancestry was connected to, but you're not going to have all the abilities of those true fey. Yeah. Now, as I as I under, as I understand it, you now this is using a this is using a d twenty based approach as far as its core mechanic, but as I as I understand it, a lot of the intricacies within it are not, are not going to be this are not going to be the same. Um, of course, of course, the chief of course the chief among them is. Is the is the class list because unless the, unless you have additional classes planned, I only see um, five classes. Um, oh, we have a few more now. Um, so the total number of classes now is you got your fighter, mm-hmm. gunslinger. There's the rogue, and then there's four spellcasting classes. There's this there's the sorcerer, and they're like the academic scholarly spellcasters. So they go to like university um, mm-hmm. or study under as an apprentice under under a sorcerer. And they view magic like like a, like a, like like science. So you're like studying the laws of it. Then you got the mystics who are the divine casters. So they get their magic through their devotions to a deity or ancestral spirits or whatever. The druids who are nature based. And then you've got the witches. And the witches are um, the witches are really fun. They're they're the, they're the class, a class I'm really proud of because they have access to a group of spells which in are called the ritual spells. And they're the only spells in the system that require material components. And they also can create these amulets, the minor and major amulets that have a variety of different abilities. They might give you enhanced uh, ability scores. Um, you might have, like, say, a minor amulet of the bear, which gives you like enhanced strength and fortitude and the likes, you know? Or they could be something very specific, like there's a witch's bottle. Um, but the point is that the ritual spells and the um, amulets in the witch class are all based on historical or archaeological examples of European folk magic. 
mm-hmm. like every single one of them, down to the lists of material components, which can be very specific. But we do say, of course, in the book, if you want to change these rooms, you can. But like, yeah. say, for example, there's one spell, a first level defensive spell uh, called Mandrake Shield. And the material, and so like you can cast this spell as a reaction to try and block an attack, okay? Mm-hmm. And um, the material components for the spell are mandrake that had grown under a hangman's gallows, as well as some cord from a hangman's noose and nails from the gallows, all kept in a simple cloth bag. Now that specific example of a spell I got when reading an academic paper on protective folk magics that were used in German-speaking regions of Europe in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. And in the article, they talk about how they would collect these things, mandrake that had grown under... Because that's like one of the things with mandrake, you know, it's like it's a it's a plant that's, that occurs many times in occultism and folk magic in Europe. And mm-hmm. one of the things was it was regularly found growing under the gallows. Um, um, but even in the academic paper, they talk about how um, executioners were very much viewed as outsiders of society. Like people wouldn't marry into an executioner's family. They would intermarry with other families or with other professions like tanners that were very much kind of ostracized and used as outsiders. Um, and depending on where you lived, you might only get paid per execution. So how they would actually make extra money was they would do things like sell bits of twine from the hangman's noose or nails, or they'd collect plants and say, oh yeah, this grew under the gallows and sell them to people who would use it in their folk magic. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so that's the bit. So I'm very proud of that particular class that is like, no, no, no. Like, obviously for the game, I was like, I was making up cool spells, but I was like, no, no, these ones we really try to have them based as, as faithful as we can on either archaeological examples like witches' bottles, which you find across half of Europe. Um, Mm -hmm. They were a protective amulet that people would put into the walls of a house or behind a fireplace or something like that. And they were, the idea being that if a witch or somebody was trying to curse or hex the people in the house, the bottle would capture the the malignant magics and protect you. Or or examples like these spells where the examples actually come from... um, historically documented examples of of these magics so. mm-hmm. but, um, in terms of the actual as you say like you know it, it's a, it is a d20 system i mean mm-hmm. it's a fairly simple d20 system if you've played any d20 system really you'd be able to pick it up pretty quickly you know um for me personally uh, 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 i yeah. was reminded of um i was re- at least when it came to examining the character sheets i was reminded of true 20 20- Sim- um, simply because the way you, the way you handle scores and modifiers is does not have as many steps as, of conversion as the bigger entries in D twenty based games. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, as somebody who, from my day job, is teaching hard sums to teenagers who really struggle with maths, I have a lot of issues with people who turn around and say certain games are amazing because they're so simple. And I'm looking at you saying no. As somebody who day on a daily basis is working with teenagers who have numeracy problems, some of the really big systems out there, not naming them, are not simple maths. So that was a very important thing for me was to try and keep it as simple as possible. All of the modifiers in the game, it's flat modifiers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is essentially whenever you're trying to do something in Fair Earth, you're rolling an ability check. So you roll your D20, add the relevant ability score, and then any other modifiers that you might have for any training or skills or talents that might be related to the ability score. And then, it, and it's, it's so at most, we're generally adding no more than two or three numbers, all of which will be below 10, in many cases, below five mm-hmm. to your D20 roll. So I've very much tried to keep it simple um, because I feel like it, it is important to me. And, and, like, and also because like, I, I feel like, and it's because of my background in education, if you're struggling to understand the system that I've made, then I've done a bad job of explaining the system, you know? Um, it's not on you as the user who's messing up because you don't understand it. It's on me as the creator who did a bad job of, of explaining it, you know? Um, so, so yeah, mm-hmm. I've very much tried to keep it streamlined in that sense. Um, so that if you have played if you have played another D20 system and you mm-hmm. come to Fair, you'll be like, 
oh, this is great. This is like, I just have to add these three numbers. That's it. I don't have to worry. You, you, you're never, it's never a case of when do I add this or that. It's always your ability score. And then do you have anything that you could that you know how to do or naturally can do that could help you with what you're trying to do? Mm -hmm. And that's it. And with that in mind, I'd like to, I'd like to go through some, some of the classes and just get a feel for what, what particular things that they're going to bring to the table, and what sort of and what sort of play styles they're going to be um, leaning into. Mm -hmm. um, I.e., I've talked on the podcast. I've talked a lot about the idea of class fantasies, and that is just as applicable here. So, mm -hmm. I suppose the first place to start with is the fighter, because um, I, honest, I honestly think the I honestly think fighters in a lot of fantasy games get a raw deal. <laughs> Oh yeah, like I'm, I, I, I've gone on record and said I'm not a fan of 5e. I know that might make people hate me. I don't care. Um, I respect. You're them in for good what company done, here. Yeah, but I respect them for what they've done. I'm not a fan. The last time I played a game of 5e, I played a human fighter, and I've decided if I'm ever playing in a 5e game ever again, it will be as a human fighter, because I actually think they are the one of the most customizable class options in that system. Um, but in Fey Earth, so one of the big things in Fey Earth is one of the mechanics that we have in the game, which is a thing called feats. So uh, the action economy in Fey Earth is quite simple. You have a major mm -hmm. action in every turn and two minor actions. And your major action is your action action, you know, your attack, spell, the usual thing, okay? Minor actions are used for things like drawing and shielding weapons, swapping out weapons, taking a potion, that kind of stuff, giving some, uh, something to another person, stealthing, um, but they're also used for like your reactions mm -hmm. and movement. And then on top of that, you have the feat mechanic. So the feat mechanic, there's three types of feats. There's combat feats, spell feats, and social feats. But the feat mechanics are like cool signature special moves that you've trained in. So going with the fighters, get three levels of training, both in fighting skills, so that's like weapon proficiencies, and, and also other combat-based proficiencies. Um, and then they also get three levels of training in uh, combat feats. So they get to learn special moves. So they're talking about things like, say, maybe faint or disarm or, you know, a, a mighty blow so you do extra damage or, um, you know, a quick attack so you get an extra attack with your turn. And the mm -hmm. way it works, the way the mechanic works is quite simple in that um, when you roll to attack, you're trying to beat your target's defense score, okay? Mm -hmm. Defense is calculated based on the size of your opponent, their fighting stat, their dexterity, and then a couple of other minor modifiers, like flat modifiers that might come into it, like flanking bonuses and the likes, okay? Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to meet or beat their defense score to land your hit. Mm -hmm. You can, if you have training in a, in a, in a feat, so with a fighter or a combat feat, then when, before you roll, you declare, I am going to try and do this feat. That costs you one of your minor actions, and the feat has a feat cost based on how powerful the feat is and how much training you have. Because you can take training to additional training in a feat to lower the cost. And mm -hmm. essentially, when you roll your attack, you have to beat the defense of your target by an amount equal to or greater than the feat cost. So I'm trying mm -hmm. to hit a giant, and it has a defense of 14, which isn't that high because it's a giant, it's five meters tall, it's pretty easy to hit, and I'm trying to use the quick attack feat, and that's, say, four feet points, then mm -hmm. 14 plus four, I have to roll an 18 or higher. Mm -hmm. If I roll... If I beat the defense, but not by enough to hit the feet cost, my attack still lands. The attack does still land because I did beat the defense. My minor action is spent and the feet doesn't get used. But if I beat it by the, the grand total, including the feet cost, my attack lands, and now I get to use my cool signature move that my fighter character has training in. So, because I was always thinking about, like, in the stories of the heroes, the Swatch Brothers, whatever, that so often they would have this cool thing that they could do in a fight with their sword or with their sheet or whatever it was. I was like, how can you mechanically bring that into the game? So that's a big thing that the, that the fighters have, which is really fun because it means you can make a very customized fighter, you know? They'll be good in general at fighting, but then they'll have a certain set of skills that they can bring into the game. Similar, I suppose, in a way kind of to the battle maneuvers features that they have in the fighter class in 5e, similar but still different um, because there's no limit on the number of combat. In theory, there's no limit on the number of combat feats you could learn 
There's like, mm -hmm. I think about 12 or 15 combat feats in the system. And if you were burning all of your resources, you could in theory learn pretty much all of them. Or you could become hyper specialized in two or three so mm -hmm. that you're only having to beat your target's defense by like a one or a two. So yeah. that's the fight. Um, really fun and very customizable. Mm -hmm. Of course, for me personally, I appreciate the fact that you don't have you don't have an issue that I've ha I've had with some games where um, if you beat if you beat defense by five or you beat defense by fifty, <laughs> um, the result is still the same, and that's kind of lame. Well, that's where the feats really come into it as well. Um, mm -hmm. Now, of course, you are burning a resource. So, as I said, minor action also includes reactions. So, mm -hmm. so for example, the spellcaster classes, especially, they'll often, they might say, in their turn, say, oh, I'm, I'm going to hold one of my minor actions. So I have a reaction. So later on, I may be able to cast counterspell. You know, that kind of stuff comes into it. Because that was another thing I don't like is, in a lot of systems, you've got your a major action, some sort of a, a minor action or a bonus action maybe, and then you've got your movement, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I have many, many, many years of training in fencing and sword play. Um, when I first went to university, I joined a sports fencing club, and I did that for about three odd years. Then I got into historical uh, medieval combat, and I did that for about eight, ten years. And now, then I got into historical European martial arts, which I still do, which is mm -hmm. where you're wearing the most modern safety equipment, but fighting in a really historically accurate fashion. Unlike historical reenactment, where you're wearing the most historically accurate clothing, but fighting in like like an advanced type of stage fighting, so you don't kill the person. Mm -hmm. In historically European martial arts or Hima, your primary target is the head and face. So my knowledge of fighting with swords and the likes is quite extensive. Um, and something that's always bugged me about the way action economy breaks down in, in combat systems where you've got your major actions and minor actions are reactive and then movement is like, well, if you're not moving, you should be able to do something with that time and energy that you didn't spend moving, which is what we have in Fayerth, where uh, movement is a minor action. So you can be using your minor actions to move around and tactically position yourself, or you could be saying, no, no, I'm going to stay where I am. And now I have this minor action free that I can be using to... To, to use it on something like a feat to add to an attack or as a reaction or using it to like do parries or other things as well. It was like trying to make a more dynamic combat system in, in, in fair. Not that fair it's only about combat, but when you are fighting, yeah, and that's when I've play tested it with people, either in mini campaigns or one shots, that's like the one thing that my play testers have all commented on is they loved how dynamic the combat system is. They really feel like they have a lot more freedom and choice in what they can do in combat than mm -hmm. you get in a lot of other systems. And yeah. you, as you said, correctly said, rolling high, if you have trained in skills, can really benefit you in a way it doesn't in other systems. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the gunslinger, obviously, obviously, the, obviously the name alone gives gives some aspect of it, but since we're dealing with since we're dealing with 18th century tech, I'm cur I'm curious how how that how that would how that would manifest with the gunslinger. Well, it's later 18th century tech, mm -hmm. so we have had the development of rifling technologies, mm -hmm. and it's not, not no longer any single shot muskets and flintlocks and like that. Okay, mm -hmm. now look, this game was never designed to be a historically accurate war gaming system. This was about <laughs> no, <bringing that's>... folklore <laughs> and stories of old. So please, all and also. Like, my background is swords, not guns, not pew-pews. So <laughs> all the gun nuts, you'll have to forgive me. In Fey Earth, you have, there is a revolver, rifle, shotgun, and then there is a troll gun, which is basically an elephant rifle, but with a cooler sounding name. Mm -hmm. Okay? So uh, that's it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And your, your, rifle, your revolver, it can hold six bullets. The rifles are later 19th century cartridge loading, you know, um... I can't remember what they were called even bolt action i think is what they were you know yeah. so we're talking so that's what we're talking about you're not having to now we do have a gun jam mechanic in the game you know if you're all in that one your gun jams and that would be you know but um but 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 in terms of damage um i didn't bother giving extra lethality because it just makes things messy and complicated like your your guns are going to do more damage than your swords mm -hmm. um 
Um, the one exception being the shotgun. The shotgun I decided, and I don't know, this might be controversial, but the way the shotgun damage works is at, if they're within like three meters of you, you roll a d12. If they're within five meters of you, that drops to a d10. And the further away they are, the lower the damage die becomes because it's a shotgun, you know? And, you know, if, if you fire a shotgun at somebody, but they're like 15, 20 meters from you, mm -hmm. You're you're probably just gonna annoy them, you know. Like you know, especially when we talk about nineteenth century shotguns, where you know they're you know depending on what yeah. You know, so that that kind of thing came into it, and obviously the firearms have like really great range, you know. Um, if you want to be a ranged fighter in this system, train in guns, not bows, not crossbows, not throwing knives, not throwing axes. Get a gun because they have the best range in the system, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that's it. Um, and then with the gunslingers, what the gunslingers have is they've got unique skills specific to their profession. So you've got things like uh, quick shot, where you're, you, where you're using your minor action to get extra attacks in. Um, you've got driving shot, where you push them back. Sniper, where you're, you're, you don't suffer penalties from, um, from, from range. You've got the, one of the one of the one of the skills. You're basically dead shot. Like when mm -hmm. you get the mastery level, you're basically dead shot. Um, your enemies have zero protection from cover. Um, and then you've got like trick shots where you've got like you can do call shots. Um, uh, and then there's one arcane artillery where if you have um, if you have a magic score of one or greater, you can be tapping into that and adding your magic score to your damage modifier. And then that that additional damage counts as magic damage. The idea that you're harnessing your arcane spark because of your natural, say, fey blood or something. So my my, my, my wife's character, the frost giant uh, blooded fey twitch gunslinger, that was one of the things that she had. Uh, no, she eventually did get magic bullets on a magic revolver, um, which was pretty cool. But, but you know, yet again, lots of choices in how you're doing stuff. So you could be using a minor action and say, okay, I'm going to use my minor action and do a trick shot and try and shoot them in the leg so they now drop to the ground prone. Or I'm using my minor action to do a quick shot and get an extra attack this turn, you know? Mm -hmm. So you've got, a, yet again, you've got a lot of customization. Like, uh, at one stage, toward the end of our campaign, the group, there was this really high-level group of mercenaries that the bad guys had hired. Mm -hmm. And um, they were fighting them. And there was, a, there was a gunslinger in that group who I'd deliberately given training in different skills to the party's gunslinger. So he, she had never focused on trick shots and stuff. So he was doing all these called headshots, doing double damage, torso shots stunning you for a turn you know all this stuff that that she couldn't do but she was able to attack more per turn you know so you you get these choice of do i want to just be a barrage of attacks or do i want to be a specialist in some way mm -hmm. and i did a, i did a bit of i did a bit of checking about i did a bit of checking about when it came to when it came to when it came to firearms from that from this era um Bolt action, what well, bolt action would have been at the t would have been at the tail end of the century. So it definitely, so it definitely fits. Like the early, a lot of the early ones that I that that I could dig up were around the eighteen eighties. Mm. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I wanted to have things like bolt action from a game design perspective and from a game mechanics perspective is really mm -hmm. great because you know it, it, it it's a really simple reload action. In mm -hmm. your firearm, so I'm like, yeah, like technically, did they have bolt action rifles in 1872? I don't, I can't remember, and if they did, they might have been really basic. But I have no problem saying, well, they're they slightly did. more advanced, you know, they they're did. slightly better than they should have been because it just mm -hmm. means that it's less mechanics that you're trying to worry about because, like, you know, as I say, the the the, the accuracy in the game was accuracy on the folklore, not on the history, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. Um, and for and for what it's worth, there there are exam there are examples like the um, let's see where did they have, where did they have it? Um, like there was there was one that was made in it there was one that was made in Italy in um, it either made or was put or was put into service in eighteen seventy. Yeah. So like yeah. So you do like and actually that's the thing like I didn't notice but the jump in firearms technology in the nineteenth century is terrifying. When you look at what a gun could do in 1801 versus 1841, and between 1841 and 1881, and between 1881 and 1899, it's terrifying how much they advanced technologically. Like, really scary. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but, but that's also why I just said, no, it's going to simplify. There are four different types of gun, nice bit of range, but, you know, if you want to be playing in a game with super historically accurate guns, there are really great games for that. But that's not what they are today, you know? Truth be, truth be told, what I'd be, what, something that I'd be interested in and, so, and something that I'd, e- I'd, either ha- I'd either house rule or, or the like is how, how, fire, how, firearms acca- how firearm development accounted for, de- for dealing with, um, fit, for dealing with fey creatures. Is- so that was, that was one thing in the game. Um, towards the end of our campaign, um, they were basically dealing with uh, a group of ancient fey that had been followers of Krom Kruuk, who was a god from ancient or from Irish um, mythology, um, pretty nasty guy. Um, but um, in the game, I kind of tweaked him a bit and said, "Well, he was this ancient dark fey being. He wasn't an elf or a fairy or a goblin. He was a singular entity. And there was a bunch of them back then, and they were trying to rule over humans and fey alike. And there was this massive alliance four thousand years ago, and they drove them into the fey realm and blocked them away and imprisoned them. And the part we were fighting a bunch of people who were trying to release him from his chains." So they were fighting these like four thousand year old fairies, who had like a defense score of twenty five, you know, mm-hmm. because they're really tiny, because fairies are tiny, and they're super fast. So, you know, when they were trying to shoot at them, like in answer to your question of firearms, it was a case of um, any of the NPC soldiers in the army. They were like, unless they rolled an at twenty, they they couldn't hit a fairy with their rifles, you know, but. One of the other mechanics I have with the shotgun is that if you miss with a shotgun, um, you can you still do like half damage or quarter damage to your target because of the spray effect of a shotgun. So I actually in the story and it, like it, it happened like in the podcast like a few episodes back from where we're at that the army started moving from good old fashioned rifles. They started equipping the soldiers with shotguns because when they're fighting these fey. They couldn't hit them because they were so small and so fast. But mm-hmm. they start using shotguns instead. Now they were hitting them at least some of the time. So in answer to your point of how does firearms affect the Fey, it's very much a case of it depends on which Fey you're trying to shoot. Yeah. Yeah. And the other, th- and of course, of course, I did. I did notice that you have, you have some some of the characters on the on the um, pre on the pre gen end of things. We'll have um, we'll have e- we'll utilize either lead bullets or iron bullets. So I'm guessing we're going with the thing of of iron has adverse effects to certain types of fey. It does. Now this is a fun this is the fun bit about it is it has a, 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 a adverse effects on certain types of fey, specifically fey indigenous to Ireland and Scotland, because that's where that comes from. That bit of mm-hmm. um, folklore is only in Irish and Scottish folklore. Nowhere else in European folklore, or actually any wider folklore that I'm aware of, do any cultures that have stories about fairies and fae and other things ever talk about the creatures having an aversion or vulnerability to iron. It's a uniquely Irish and Scottish thing. Um, so in the game, you if, you're, if, you're, if your characters are facing fae from those regions, then they have a vulnerability to iron. So in our campaign... And the army of dar- of of evil corrupted dark fae they were fighting included things like um, fairies and pukas and leprechauns, which are obviously Irish, but then there was also goblins and um, dwarves. Um, and if they shot them with iron, it hurt just as much as any other bullet would, but had no other adverse effect on them because goblins weren't ever. There's no stories in any folklore of goblins having vulnerability to iron. So it's, you know, you've got this kind of mix and match thing, which is also a fun thing from a GM's perspective of that you could be, you could have your party face a fey creature and then they face another one of the same type, but it's from a different part of Europe and they don't realize, oh, the thing that worked the first time isn't going to work this time. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the... I want to hold. I was tempted to go to go into the mystic next, but I want to hold off on the casting classes and focus on the rogue. Um. I, now, obviously, a lot a lot of people have certain assumptions with the rogue skill monkey, stabby stabby, um, per, the person who's fr- who's probably hiding in the bushes, not not effing in them like the Oasis song. Sorry, I had to get that out of my system, <laughs> but. 
What, uh, but what does the rogue bring to the table in terms of the version of them in Fey Earth? So the rogues are similar to the gunslingers that they have um, class-specific skills, so things like stealth, um, uh, you know, sleight of hand, pick locks, you know, traps, catch grace, which is one basically, catch grace, essentially they have parkour, um, and um, so they're really good at like getting in and out of buildings, climbing walls and stuff, but at higher levels they also can use their react, a uh, minor action to try to dodge attacks. So yet again, it's a case of, I try to give a lot of choice in what type of a rogue you want to be. Um, I had one, not, not, not any of my current players, but I had one friend of mine who and, and used to play in our campaign several years back, and then he had to leave because I don't know, university or something like that, he had to leave anyway. Um, and he'd created this rogue who was basically a stealth monkey and super scout, you know? They were really good at stealth, they were really good at getting in and out of buildings, that kind of stuff. But then when it came to combat, he was really struggling because he hadn't put any resources or any training into the weapons that his character had. Mm -hmm. um, also, with the rogues, you have a choice. It's at seventh level, I think, you get to choose between two different branches. Um, one is called the, the Shadowcaster, which is where you basically gain certain spells of illusion and, uh, and the likes. Mm -hmm. um, kind of an arcane trickster type thing, okay? And then you've got um, the other type is the Shadow Master, where you essentially get additional levels of training in rogue skills and, and just skills in general. And then um, he went the shadow caster idea and he created this character who was really useful at like, like breaking into places, stealthing around, tracking NPCs, you know, was really good at that kind of side of things. But then was finding that when he was in combat, because he had over specialized in that, was really having difficulty if he was facing fighters and the likes of higher defense scores, you know? And then another one of our players, Neve, who played the, the wonderful Olaf, was my favorite character, who's this dysfunctional dwarf from the frozen Fey nation of Jotunheim, um, who, um, when she was designing Olaf, um, she went with, and actually it's it's funny because she's technically playing a true Fey because when I initially started Fey Earth five years ago, the four playable lineages were going to be human, Fey, Twitch, Goblin, and Dwarf. But about a year into playtesting, I realized this doesn't work in terms of the game mechanics and balance. If you are true Fey, you would like you would need to be coming up with reasons to hobble your character because if they're actually a goblin or a dwarf, they even at first, even as they couldn't have a first or second level character, they'd be way more powerful than they are. So mm -hmm. in campaign one, we technically have one of our heroes as true Fey, but in the actual game itself, you can't play true Fey. But um, she went with the shadow caster, which was additional levels of training. And I've got to say, she created one of the most balanced characters I've ever seen on paper in any game, in any system, ever. It was mm -hmm. unbelievable. She was the epitome of the jack of all trades, but master of none is better than a master of one. You know? Um, and she was, she was good in a fight, but not amazing. She was really stealthy, but, you know, sometimes if she'd roll low, she might get caught, you know? Likewise, she was really good at sleight of hand and sneaky stuff, but yet again, if she roll low, she might, you know? So it was, so, so yet again, with the rogue, we've I very much tried to give you choices over, well, what do you want in terms of your character? So if you decided to go with the arcane and trickster y magic -y type one, you know, when you're getting extra spells, well, then you might decide, well, I actually don't need to be putting stuff into stealth because I have spells that will help with that, you know, instead. Mm -hmm. um, or other or illusions, you know, um, instead of, you know, charm and stuff to beguile. So I can put more into, like, maybe my fighting stats or into my dexy stats or whatever. Or if you go with the non-magic based one where you get the extra training, you can be like Neve was where I'm going to be just really good at everything or become hyper-specialized and be a master at one or two things. Mm -hmm. now, when it, now, um, when it comes to the casting classes, you obviously in the, in the material that, that's currently available, there's the mystic and the sorcerer, and you dipped a bit into the sorcerer as the scholarly caster. Um, yeah. What can you tell me about the, about the mystic? Is that more the, is that the more old school kind of caster. Well, I mean, the so the 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 mystics um, get their get their ma their connection to magic is through their faith. So in in the world of Fey Earth, nobody knows where magic comes from. 
Mm -hmm. um, some people say it comes from the fair realm, the land where the fairies came from. Some people think it comes from the fair itself. Some people think it's a force of nature like gravity. <laughs> Certainly the, the scholarly sources might say that. Mm -hmm. um, and the druids would say it comes from the land itself. The witches would say it comes from the energy within items. Um, and they gain that energy through their nature or through their use, you know? So no one knows. Um, um, but the mystics say that they get their connection of, of magic through divine worship of a deity or deities or through uh, a general kind of more ancestral worship, you know? Because I, I'm keeping things vague because, like, the thing is, like, because it's set in an alternate 19th century Europe, it's still Earth where you've got things like Christianity and Islam and Judaism and Hinduism. And I was like, I kept religion in the game super vague and don't mention it in great detail at all because I don't want to be getting into that discussion with people, you know, and people get very defensive and offended about stuff, you know. So the mystics gain their magic from a connection with their deities, whoever those deities may be, or if they don't have a specific deity, maybe an ancestral spirit, whichever that may be. Um, so they have access to the, the, the kind of spe magic that they can learn from are the elemental spheres of magic, spheres of the wild, life, death, illusion, enchantment, beguilement, healing, that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and there is, um, you do have a thing as a mystic, you, you, at fifth level, you take the vow. So you got things like the vow of life. You want to try and keep people alive and you're, you become a good healer or, you know, you've got other ones like, oh, say, the vow of judgment where you're trying to, like, you're seeking out wrongdoers and punishing them and... And so that, yet again, we're getting back to uh, the theme that, you're, that I keep bringing back, customization in my game, mm -hmm. um, so that when you pick a, um, when you pick one of the, when you pick your vow, um, that's it, that is your vow, you don't get to swap it out, um, and if you start doing stuff that would go against that vow, you'll lose some of the abilities that you gain with it, because with the vow, like, say you took the vow of righteousness, so you choose a sacred enemy whose actions go against the belief of your faith. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a specific individual from a religion or a sect or a cult or whatever, you know. You'll decide that based on your backstory. And then at, at fifth level, you gain one of the spells, Shield of Faith, which as, a, as an additional free spell, um, and it's like, this is one of the defensive spells. And um, whenever you know one of your sacred enemies around, you gain bonuses to casting rolls and stuff like that. At tenth level, you gain another spell, that's a divine smite. At fifteenth level, you gain a spell after armor. So you're gaining, so if you do something that goes against your value, you would gain those free spells that you got and the extra boons that you would get with it, okay? But mm -hmm. it, it does, like, it, it, like it's just trying to give you an extra idea, well, well, what type of a priestly person or mystic are you, you know? Are you somebody who's all about, you know, you have your sacred enemy of religion and you're going against them, or are you like, no, let's try to preserve life, or you could be someone who's like, I'm going to prove to everybody that my religion is the best religion out there and everybody should be following that. You might say, like, or you could be like, a bit of a nature worship and hippie kind of like trying to balance and everything or like they even have like one of them was like the vow of darkness if you wanted mm -hmm. to play an evil character you'd go with that or the vow of like um justice or freedom so so that's so that's how the mystics essentially work mm -hmm. um in that sense yeah now with that with that in mind i did notice that there is a bit of a that there is a bit of a sphere system when it comes yeah. to casting itself yeah Oh. So there is, there's 13 main spheres, not including the ritual spells that are specific to the witches. Um, so these are astral force, the four elemental spheres, mm -hmm. um, wild, life, death, chaos, and twilight, okay? Mm -hmm. um, different professions have access to different spheres. So the sorcerers have access to the sphere of the arcane and force. Arcane is like meta magic, your dispel mm -hmm. magic, your alchemy, that kind of stuff. Forces, well, telekinesis type stuff. They yeah. also have access to the four elemental spheres, the sphere of death, the sphere of um, chaos, which is like spells and charming and begotten, and the sphere of twilight, which is, I call it the magic of the in-between places, so it spells through illusion, shadows, but also things like teleportation and scry, okay? And mm -hmm. um, then the other, the druids and the mystics and the witches, they have, none of those have access to the spheres of the arcane and force. They have access to all the other spheres that the sorcerers have, and on top of that, access to the sphere of the life and astral okay mm -hmm. when you create your character and you start learning spells at first level um you can pick from any of the spheres in your profession but you can only ever learn from a maximum of five spheres of magic mm -hmm. so therefore you do end up 
choosing what type of caster am I? And you still have a lot of choice with five spheres of magic, but it does mean that you could have two sorcerers or two mystics or two druids who are completely different in their abilities. There are certain things like the druids pick a favorite elemental sphere. So you'll pick one of the elemental spheres of your druid because I was thinking the druids are kind of like a cross between tree hook and hippies and banders from mm-hmm. Avatar, you know? Um, so, yeah. so you've got those kind of things. And, and for the witches, the witches start the game with access to this ritual sp- spells as one of their five spheres, and then they pick four from the other 11, you know, mm-hmm. as you're leveling up. But um, so, And the only other restriction is that if you wish to take a spell at a higher level, you must have at least one spell in that sphere from the previous level. So that's yeah. that's how. So so the idea being that like no magic has a flavor and there are different types of magic, um, but and you do decide that well what kind of a caster do I want to be, um, mm-hmm. which makes for really interesting. It's kind of funny like when you start off, it's like for the first two three levels you're it's good, and then you get to about fourth fifth level, and you've already picked say three spheres of magic, and you're like, oh crap, I only have two left. You know, and at about fourth, fifth level, you're like, you start really thinking about, well, what type of character do I have? And by the time you get to about sixth, seventh level, you've probably picked your five spheres, so now you're locked in. But by sixth, seventh level, you're going to have a good idea of what type of character am I playing anyway, you know? Mm-hmm. Now, with, with, that, with that in mind, I'm, guess, I'm guessing that, with, that within, de- within development of... Of the of the spell casting system, that there's that there's going to be a um, there's going to be a short list of spells for each t- is it a short list of spells for each um t- for each tier for in, within their particular spheres? Yeah, so there's like however many first, second, third. It goes with the fifth level spells. So mm-hmm. you've got um, however many first, second, third level, fourth, and fifth level spells mm-hmm. in each sphere, and there's the same number of spells at each level in each sphere. Yeah. So no one sphere would have more spells than another. And I've I may have mentioned this the last time I had you on, but I ha- but I am very appreciative of having a a mana point system instead of using um, spell charges instead of yeah, using the Vancean model. Yeah, I mean, look, my my introduction to to gaming was second edition D anD D in the nineties. So mm. I'm very familiar with the Vancean model, and it does create a very simple mechanic for magic, but I'm not a fan of it because I find it very limiting. Um, so that's why I went with a spell point man based yeah. system um, uh, for the game. And yet again, people who play tested it, who are more used to more va- traditional Vancean style models, a comment that they've made, people who love playing castles, and they get to this and they're like, I love the freedom. I can tell, I because with a lot of the spells, you can upcharge them by spending more mm-hmm. mana on the spell, and then you've got a lot more control. Okay, how much do I want to do? I want to spend. Am I going to supercharge this first level spell, or cast a second level spell of the same cost? You know, and um, so you get those choices, um, which was why I went with that system. Because mm-hmm. honestly, I don't really see. I don't buy into the argument that mana-based systems are more complicated. Not, especially not, especially not when you've got a whole, ho- especially when you've got a whole host of people who are going to be coming into tabletop through video games, and the amount of the amount of the amount of video the amount of um, computer RPGs, whether computer or console RPGs. That are going to be using the Vancian model are in the vast minority. I think maybe yeah, very much so. I think I think may, um, the like stuff like the Suikoden games use it. The um, Pathfinder games by Owlcat use it. But nine times out of ten, if a game has a magic s- system in a vi- in a um, in a computer or console RPG. It's going to be using a point system, especially since something like that is going to be a hell of a lot easier to program for. Yeah, absolutely. And so, like people coming in to my game, video games, this is going to be very familiar to them. Mm-hmm. And 
I am I am aware that 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 is that is blasphemous for me for me to for me to say, but I've always been very critical of the Vancean model for a couple reasons. One, um, because because of the limited slots, you can very easily run into what 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 we like to call the rainy day paradox or the ninety nine megalixers problem. Oh, you know that you know that guy who holds up who holds on to healing potions. Even up, even up, even up through the fight with the bee bag because he might need to use them later, and he never yeah, does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the yeah. rainy day paradox. You're saving yeah. for a rainy day that never and rain never comes. Yeah. Um, the other, the other problem was the Vancean model. Obviously, is named after Jack Vance, and comes from his Dying Earth series of novels. Dying Earth leans far more into sword and sorcery instead of high fantasy, and it's a little hard for me to justify such a limitation when magic is so rampant throughout the throughout a given set, throughout the given setting or storytelling motif. Mm. Oh. Yeah, no, I agree, and and I do think that you know, as you said, the, the rainy day paradox. You're less likely to fall into that with a a numerical point based system because you know you you you've got a you got a resource that you're kind of you get a lot more control over how quickly you burn through it you know mm-hmm. um like what was interesting actually was in our campaign that it's just finishing up um i was the, the because the players are fighting these ancient really powerful fey um, the sorcerer in the party has access to dispel magic that's from the spirit of the arcane so only sorcerers have that but they have that, so they could use their minor actions to try and counter the magics of the Fae, including some horrific curses. But that meant they had to choose. Um, that was costing them mana, you know? So then they were like, do I save my mana to attack, or do I use my mana now to defend my fellow party members, you know? Mm-hmm. And there were one or two situations when they, I was like, the fairy is going to cast a spell. Is anybody doing anything? Looking at the player who's playing the sorcerer, and they were and they didn't say anything. It was like, is anybody doing anything? Okay, they cast a spell. Turning to my gunslinger, give me a choice: fortitude or resolve. Okay, you failed. You are hit with a maiming curse. Your leg starts to spasm. You drop to the ground as your leg is warped, as the muscles and bones in you are, you know. And they're like, then they get hit with and It's like now, now one of the players is out, you know. So you do so. Like now, that was we were at epic level. I say we were top tier level get campaign at that stage. Mm-hmm. But it, it was really like it, it brought a lot. It brought tactics into the game, you know. Like my players had to be thinking tactically, not just about what am I doing in this moment, but how am I spending my resources that I as a player have with my character, you know. Mm-hmm. Now. With the, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the for the full book? I don't know entirely because a big part of the page count will be based on the people who format the book and the layout. And those people are magicians. Formatting is true sorcery. The way they actually do that is unbelievable. But that being said, it's going to be a chunky boy. I reckon... I wouldn't be surprised if it's about two hundred and fifty pages. Mm-hmm. I can, so, I can I can certainly I can certainly see that. It's just the thing is it's one book, okay? Mm-hmm. So it's just one book. So the first third of the book really is the player's handbook section of it, with all of the mechanics for the game and all the information you need on the playable professions, um, relevant skills, the magic, and all the rest of it. Okay, and then there's the then the, then. Maybe the middle third or possibly quarter is your GM's guide um, with tips on how to run the game as a GM, you know, um, how to consider how to set up your campaign, different styles of play. Do you want to play, you know, a sandbox game? Are you going to be playing a very plot driven, maybe someone's a railroaded game? And then I was talking about the very important thing, which is player safety, um, which is important. And I'm glad to see it's a, that, that player safety is appearing in more and more actual core rule books. And then the last, whatever one minus one third and one quarter is right now, it's very late here. Um, but the last um, 
two fifths, I think, I don't know, um, will be essentially the zoological compendium. So stat blocks for the various different fae that you're going to use in, in the game, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So that's what. So, so yeah. So like it. As I said, it, it's it's going to it's going to be a chunky boy. So somewhere between two two fifty, probably closer to the two fifty mark. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops as the as the Kickstarter gets uh, it gets its momentum. Yeah, but no, with too, the, as I say, yeah. it's it's there is a lot to it, and as I say, we got some really fun stretch goals like um, like like the. Expansion East with our Slavic folklore. So, yeah, I'm really, really eager to get it out there. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for coming all the way back to the temp to the temple and enjoy and enjoying the bit of crazy that happens around around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. No, I really do. It's, it's great. I, look, I love any excuse to talk about my game. Mm -hmm. And it's great to come back and talk to somebody who have talked about it before. So thank you very much for mm having -hmm. me. My pleasure. And as any, again, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Thanks. I'm gonna have to head off to the pub now. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I wish I could, I wish I could join you, but I'm in. But I'm in, and I'm in a whole other country for that. <laughs> Um, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.